Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's topic is going to continue along uh, setting the, the stage for the Beatles, the Fab Four, which I think we've learned that it was more than four people that made Beatlemania possible. Uh, it's more like 40 to 400 people in the background off camera that made the Beatles who they were. And you've got a lot of imagery and publicity and marketing involved with the Beatles. So I dived into them. I was a huge Beatle fan. I bought most of their albums. I'm here to tell you uh, that the story is uh, of the Beatles, how you believe it, it's not true, and that they had a lot of help. And I've come to the conclusion that they didn't write all their music. I find it uh, implausible that they wrote all their music. I believe they collaborated and contributed to some of the music, and um, but they didn't pick the wardrobe, and they didn't pick the themes, and they didn't pick the um, social media messaging. They didn't pick Helter Skelter. They didn't pick, you know, I Am the Walrus. They didn't pick a lot of the, you know, multiple messaging themes that you can see within Beatles songs. Or if you can play the song backwards, Paul is dead, Paul is dead. You have, there's so many fake messaging combined with real messaging, applied linguistics, that, yeah, you can see Tavistock social engineering's fingerprints, but if it's not them, then it's the Church of Scientology or it's the Process Church or it's some clandestine services programming involved with some of the messaging with revolving the Beatles. Anyway, the Beatles technically uh, were, you know, talented guys, but you should know that Pete Best was the one that really was the most important Beatle initially because he had contacts for venues to play. His family had contacts and I believe owned one of the venues they played in. And um, so that created an opportunity for John Lennon and Paul McCartney to get a venue. And then Pete Best was the most popular Beatle with the girls, so that was always good for ticket sales or popularity, right? And um, that was also true when they went over to Hamburg to play in Germany, was that Pete Best was a popular Beatle. So that was all good. Anyway, when Brian Epstein came along, I'm fast forwarding through a lot of particular details, but Brian Epstein wanted to sign the boys and he started working on that in December 1961. Had a series of meetings with John and Paul. And John and Paul and George. John, Paul, George, and Pete Best. There was no Ringo Starr at that time. And um, proposed that the boys sign a management contract which would pay Brian Epstein, um, 10 to 15 percent of all gross revenues, depending on if it was a concert uh, venue or if it was a record deal, which that was the plan to get a record deal. That's when you know you're validated. Then you don't necessarily have to perform because you can get some royalties, even though the royalties would be small. That's how the record business works, right? They want you to do the live concerts and they collect the money, right? So it's an ingenious business of techno enslavement. It's techno enslavement because if you own the radio frequencies like CBS and RCA do, all roads come to you. You can't be a rock star. You can't be a, a, a famous person on television. You can't be a movie star unless you can get publicity. And typically that's done if you own the theaters or you own the radio station, radio frequency, FCC approved, federal licensed distribution channels, you know, like 5G mesh, like that, right? You see how techno enslavement can work? Because if you don't behave yourself and do what you're told, I will delete you, I will ban you from my network. What do you think a network is? mesh network, Amazon ring camera, Amazon sidewalk, mesh, 5G, cell phone, social media. It all runs on networks of pulses, pulsing. 
And if you don't behave, I'll just turn you off. I'll turn your phone off. I'll turn your bank account off. If you have centralized bank digital currency, do you know how hard it would be to turn off your bank account and make you an irrelevant human being? A nanosecond. You should never have a digital wallet. You should never participate in a social score. You should never have digital bank currency. Ever. If you do, you lost your humanity. Now you're just a homeless person wandering around trying to figure out how to find food. But it's not, fortunately, it's not hard to find out where the bankers live and the people that control the grid. They live in conspicuous places with 40 foot hedgerows and no sidewalks. They have surveillance cameras, but I guess we learned from the Nancy Pelosi, Paul Pelosi poppycock that if you have a hammer, you can get into the house, right? No, you can't. You're probably gonna need more than a hammer. But you can find the house. You can definitely find the house. Getting in the house might be a little different because they're gonna have like a, a SWAT team waiting for you. So what I wanna tell you is that the Brian Epstein situation had to be re-rigged a few times during 1962. He signed a contract on January 24th, 1962 to manage the Beatles, but there was nothing to manage because the Beatles were sort of not known much. They could, Brian Epstein could book them for concerts and get paid, you know, 15% of, uh, you know, the gross, but uh, it's chump change, right? They got to get a record deal. So eventually they get an audition at Decca Records, which is owned by the same people that own EMI. But anyway, they flunked the audition. So there's not, nothing to see here. So he continues on. A few months later, he gets an audition with George Martin at EMI on June 6th, 1962. They pass the audition, but George Martin is dissatisfied with the drummer Pete Best, and he recommends a studio drummer be substituted. So some private meetings behind closed door where a decision is made to just uh, transfer, transfer Pete Best you know, somewhere along the way to a different band. That way he won't sue you for any contractual obligation because I believe that Brian Epstein had a promise of a record deal now that the boys would definitely get a record contract at a penny an album, but uh, that uh, Pete Best would not be part of it. So you see who's running the show here. Is, is, is Brian Epstein running the show? No. CBS and RCA Victor are running the show, right? Because they're part of the EMI family. They're running the show. And they're saying, we don't want Pete Best. So that's who fired Pete Best. They, he was fired by the invisible hand of CBS, the same people that manage Sharon Tate. The same people that manage Sharon Tate are the people who managed the Beatles. Right? Right. Sharon Tate signed a seven-year contract in 1962 with CBS and MGM called Through Filmways. Filmways is like the uh, Parlophone Records is to EMI what Filmways was to CBS and MGM film pictures. Today known as Sony Pictures. And today the Beatles company EMI is known as Sony. So all roads that Sharon Tate went through and that John Lennon and Paul McCartney went through and that Michael Jackson went through, they're all owned by Sony. So Sharon Tate essentially was in the Sony family. John Lennon was in the Sony family. <laughs> Paul McCartney is in the Sony family. Um, you, can, you can get all crossed up with, you know, Capitol Records, Virgin Records, RCA Victor, Parlophone Records. CBS Columbia Records. It doesn't matter. It's whoever controls the network, controls the social media content. So that it would not be Brian Epstein. That would not be George Martin. That would not be Paul McCartney. That would not be John Lennon. That would be the corporate suits that you hardly ever spend time with. They're the ones in control. Anyway, they redid the contract in October 1962. We went forward uh, in time. George Harrison is the first Beatle to marry. Um, well, we insert John, uh, Ringo Starr gets plugged into the Beatles, you know, after um, July 1962. So Pete Best is now playing 
for a different band that's managed by Brian Epstein. And uh, no harm, no foul. And we go forward, and um, Patty Boyd enters the picture, marries George Harrison on January 21st, 1966. Within a year, she introduces the Maharishi's seminars in London to her husband, George. And then somebody, and I think it's somebody at CBS, suggests that Paul McCartney and John Lennon, you know, start to attend the Transcendental Meditation meetings. I think that's part of the social engineering of the Travistock Institute. Because, see, <clears throat> now we're into the summer of love in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, 1967. The Beatles are starting to be aware of the Maharishi in February and March 1967, before the Summer of Love. But just before, this is when Timothy Leary has set up shop in San Francisco with Abigail Folger's mother, Enos Mejia. Timothy Leary has been in San Francisco since 1965. Enos Mejia lives on Broadway, Pacific Heights at that time. That's where Paul Pelosi and his hammer attack is it's like two blocks it's where diane feinstein lives where melvin belli lives that's where dozens of people who are associated with cia live on broadway and pacific avenue the block above larry ellison has a home in there you know he's sort of like uh, john lennon as far as i'm concerned because he's not running the show that's not his software oracle's owned by cia that's a cia product created by ampex corporation oracle didn't create oracle the CIA created Oracle database with Ampex, a contractor of theirs. And then they had to have a sales company sell it to all the corporations so that they could see all the secret files. Remember the secret files, the secret files that you don't want people to see? They're probably kept on an Oracle database, which is a CIA database. Right? Right. And why would it be different for the Beatles? It's not. It's the same thing. It's infiltration, not invasion. Infiltration, not invasion, as John Kennedy told us before he had his head blown off. Anyway, um, in 1967, we have uh, Timothy Leary and Louis Joanne West and Bill Graham, whose real name is Wolf Grajanka, conducting a honeypot operation at Sharon Meadows in a Jesuit Society of Jesus zip code in San Francisco known as Haight-Ashbury and the free medical clinic there. And we have uh, all the Columbia Records and Warner Brothers recording stars performing free concerts in San Francisco during 1967. That would be, you know, uh, the Great Society of uh, renamed, renamed Jefferson Airplane with Grace Lick without her husband. It was Great Society with her husband, who I believe was the drummer. And then she broke up with him, and uh, allegedly, and uh, went over to the Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. Um, gee, Ken Kesey rolls into town in 1967. Hunter S. Thompson is in town. The fake CIA journalist, gonzo journalist, Hunter S. Thompson. That's who all is hanging out in San Francisco, is the Laurel Canyon, Warner Brothers, Columbia Pictures, rock star groups are performing in San Francisco and the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. That's what's going on in San Francisco. And guess what? In London, England, we have something very similar going on using the Maharishi. In San Francisco, we use Timothy Leary, Tune in, turn on, drop out, use LSD, which you can get for free from our CIA free clinic, two blocks to the east. And in London, we have the Maharishi and Transcendental Meditation, which is another form of Tavistock mind restructuring, mind control, right? And we are integrating a very popular, the number one rock, band in the world, the Beatles. Because guess what? They're endorsing the Maharishi. And by endorsing the Maharishi, they are endorsing trans, transcendental meditation. By endorsing Bill Graham, Wolf Grajanka, in Haight-Ashbury, you're endorsing Timothy Leary. You're endorsing Louis Jolion West. 
And you have Abigail Folger's mother making sure everyone's getting paid, right? And in London, we have something very similar going on. We have Brian Epstein, who's on the periphery, making sure the boys go to their scheduled appointments, which now include visits with the Maharishi and Transcendental Meditation. And this continues, and I got to believe that Brian Epstein has now realized that he has lost any control over the Beatles because the Beatles are being managed by the suits upstairs. The suits. And I don't mean George Martin. I mean adult supervision of George Martin. That's who's managing the Beatles. Beatles. They're determining the album cover. They're determining their wardrobe, which you'll notice has evolved and changed. From 1962 to 1967, the Beatles go through the exact marketing that Hollywood was producing in California. You know, the flower child, love, peace and love. That's a honeypot operation. That's a CIA operation. That's a Tavistock British intelligence program to identify all the people who are anti-war, anti-conscription, right? You know, Brian Epstein was a product of conscription. He wouldn't have been in the Royal Army had he not been drafted at age 18. He wouldn't have been tossed out of the army for impersonating an officer in London in Piccadilly Circus if he hadn't agreed to see a psychologist, right? And Brian Epstein saw a psychologist in order to get a medical discharge from the Royal Army and not spend time in the stockade, which he would have had to do if he didn't see a psychologist. So Brian Epstein is controlled by the invisible hand of Army intelligence, Royal Army intelligence, and he's the manager of the Beatles, but then he shunted aside because now we have the Maharishi and we have the suits at EMI who are deciding what songs the Beatles should be publishing. Right, absolutely. Okay, and then we have the women involved. So Paul McCartney's been living with Jane Asher since 1962. She's been living with him at least since 1963 at 7 Cavendish Avenue, St. John Wood, which is a mile from Piccadilly Circus, a mile away. It's near the Regent's Park where Brian Epstein is very familiar. That's where he was stationed during the nine months that he spent in the Royal Army. He spent at St. Regis Park Armory, and that is where John, Paul McCartney had a home next to the park, and Jane Asher is in, in living in that residence. Then Jane Asher and George Harrison and Patty Boyd go off to India with John Lennon with no date and Ringo, and they go to India to 12-hour plane flight to go to the Maharishi's private mind control center for 90 days. But they don't make 90 days because there's some kind of sex scandal with an underage person. Don't know if it was a boy or girl. Don't know who's involved. May have involved the Maharishi himself. The yogi lost it. So anyway, uh, the trip was cut short, but magically the Beatles created 48 songs during this abbreviated trip to India, which I don't believe that they could produce 48 songs in about 48 days. But that's what the story is. And then they come back to London and, uh, you know, their manager has been murdered. Um, I'm sorry, I stopped and started because I had a technical problem. But before the Beatles went off to... Um, to India, they went to a private retreat in North Wales at Bangor, and Brian Epstein was supposed to attend that, but his father died, so he had to attend to his family and do a, a, a seven-day Shiva morning period after the funeral, and then he went to his home in Suffolk, you know, in Sussex, Sussex, England, which is 60 miles south of London, and um, he was planning on visiting and meeting up with the Beatles um, in Bangor, which is in close proximity to Liverpool. But uh, he was murdered in his bed um, on August 27th, 1967. All right. And then you would think that the Beatles would be, you know, not wanting to leave town. But no, they're sent in February to India to go to this Transcendental Meditation Facility, which I'm calling that a mind control center for Tavistock British Intelligence. 
So whilst that's going on, Charlie Manson is being injected into San Francisco when the Beatles are being repositioned to India. Charlie Manson is actually working with Jim Jones, Jim Jones People's Temple up in Ukiah. That's where Charlie Manson is being injected into the story. He's in Ukiah working with Jim Jones to be a preacher. Right at the time that Paul McCartney and Jane Asher and John Lennon and George Harrison and Patty Boyd are being introduced to transcendental meditation in a foreign country, in a remote area, in India, Charlie Manson is learning to be a preacher with Jim Jones. Do you see a similarity here, people? You see a similarity here? We got Charlie Manson in California, and we got the Maharishi over in India. Now, Charlie Manson is totally harmless, and I think that the Maharishi was harmless too. They're tools, though. They're total tools, just like Jim Jones is a tool. He can't afford to get a colony on Union Carbide property in French Guiana. The CIA can. British intelligence can. Right? They can. <laughs> and they do. And they do. <laughs> and this, uh, this, this uh, facility that uh, Maharishi is on, how can he afford it? Well, Doris Duke helped out. She donated a million dollars to his Transcendental Meditation. And I'm sure there were other money laundering facilities to help that property get along. And, you know, it's not just the Beatles. It's Mike Love from the Beach Boys. It's Mia Farrow, fresh off her filming of uh, Rosemary's Baby at the Dakota, which she had just wrapped up. And then she's off to, uh, to the Transcendental Meditation Facility with the Beatles, with the Maharishi. Whilst... Sharon Tate's father is working in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, trying to identify all those anti-war protesters in the free concerts, getting the free love and the free drugs. So the same operations going on in London that's going on with the number one band in the world, the Beatles, who are totally controlled. Their manager is dead. They're being run by corporate suits that they don't even know the names of. They're not in control. They're spinning in a spiral. And the bands in San Francisco, they're not in control either. Neil Young's not in control of his career. He's a polio survivor from, from Canada, from Toronto. How, how would he be able to pick, what is his famous song? Heart of Gold? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like the eye, eye of the Devil with Sharon Tate. You know, Sharon Tate signed a seven-year contract with MGM and CBS through Filmways in 1962. That's when the Beatles signed a contract with CBS, RCA, through EMI in 1962. They signed a five-year contract, which was expiring in 1967. You know, when Brian Epstein was murdered? Yeah, and Brian Epstein's contract was expiring in October 1967. But before Brian Epstein's contract could be renewed, he was murdered. Before Sharon Tate renewed her contract, which apparently she wasn't very eager to do that, she got pregnant, she wouldn't get an abortion, which was suggested to her numerous times. She cannot longer, she can't be booked for work. If you won't renew your contract, you cannot be booked for work. So she got murdered in August. 1969. Her contract was expiring December 31st, 1969. Sharon Tate was murdered the year her contract was expiring. Brian Epstein was murdered the year his contract was expiring. Probably because that's sending a message to the people that they know, hey, renew your contract a year early, you knucklehead, or else you're out. And get in line. All the survivors get in line. And if you're pregnant and have a baby, you're probably not going to want to work anyway, right? So what good are you? And this is a message that the Beatles all got. We just whacked your manager. Now, quit resisting our suggestions on the psychedelic songs that we'd like you to produce. They're trying to encourage people to take LSD. That's what they're doing in San Francisco by issuing free drugs. They want people to do what Timothy Leary said in San Francisco. Tune in, turn on, drop out. That's what transcendental meditation is. That's what est is. That's what the process church is. That's what the church of 
compulsion analysis is. That's what Church of Scientology is. It's about pacification and control. That's the whole point of MK Ultra, right? They do it in different ways. It's different flavors, different strokes for different folks. And they use the Beatles and they use the Rolling Stones and they use Led Zeppelin and they use Neil Young and they use Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and they use Santana and they use Grace Slick and they use the Jefferson Airplanes and they use Jimi Hendrix and they use Jim Morrison, whose father started, you know, the fake event that created the Vietnam War in the first place, George Morrison, Rear Admiral for the United States Navy in Bay of Tonkin. They are in complete control of the military. They are in control of banking. They are in control of social engineering, anchored bias, applied linguistics, and the Beatles are an applied linguistics, social messaging delivery platform. That's what they are. That's to be perfectly harsh. Okay, so then it's decided, I guess, that this Jane Asher isn't really the right girl for Paul McCartney as determined by above. And if you haven't realized, look at how many people Frank Sinatra was married to. Look at all the marriages in Hollywood, all the fake marriages in Hollywood. Those are produced, I believe, by executive management. They, you stay within the cult. You marry, an actress marries an actor. An actor marries the screenwriter or an actress. They're all within the cult. It's easier to control them that way. You see that. It's uncanny. None of these people ever marry outside the cult. It's very rare that that happens. So in order to torpedo Jane Asher, who has almost a five-year live-in relationship with Paul McCartney, she goes off on a work assignment when they come back from India on the abbreviated tour, and somebody puts this little Jewish girl, Francie Swartz, on an airplane, flies her from New York to London, and where she goes right down to Paul McCartney's uh, office to introduce herself. And, you know, I think the Invisible Hand must have had a handle on making sure Paul McCartney met her. And then very quick, like a bunny rabbit, she ends up in bed with Paul McCartney at his home at 7 Cavendish Avenue, St. George Wood. She's in bed. And Aunt Jane Asher comes home early, probably deliberately on purpose, according to her road manager. And she discovers Francie Swartz, who's 24, age 23, 24. It's about nine months older than Jane Asher, who, let's say she's 23. And she finds Paul McCartney in bed with this other woman, who Paul McCartney hardly knows. So Jane Asher storms out of the number seven Cavendish goes to her parents' house, you know, down near Piccadilly Circus way. And Jane Asher's mother immediately goes down to Paul McCartney's home and gathers up all of Jane's clothes and kitchen utensils. And that's the end of that relationship. So Paul McCartney carries on with this Francie Swartz, even gives her a job at his recording studio, well, the Beatles recording studio. So don't get me started on the Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles because Paul McCartney was, I believe, clandestine service controlled by this little Jewish girl from New York who comes in and torpedoes the Jane Asher relationship. And then Paul McCartney, instead of trying to get back together with Jane Asher, he carries on with this little Jewish girl who doesn't even hardly know her, and he employs her, which I don't believe that was Paul McCartney's decision. I think that was the executives upstairs say, hey, give this girl a job because she's going to be your surveillance person sleeping in your bed. And they are together for at least six months. Yoko Ono is in the picture now. And by the way, Yoko Ono, her first stop from New York to the Beatles was from to Paul McCartney. She went to number seven Cavendish Avenue to see Paul McCartney to get some songs and he wouldn't help her and he sent her over to John Lennon who then went to an art gallery with Yoko Ono who comes from nobility. Yoko Ono comes from nobility. She's CIA. She's clandestine services. She's British intelligence. And at the time that Yoko Ono is in the picture, 
See, John Lennon's married, so he can't marry Yoko Ono because, first of all, Yoko Ono is married. She's married. She's She's been married three times already before she met John. John will be number four. Now, to be fair, she was had a marriage annulled and then remarried the same person. So she's been married twice, is estranged from the second husband, whom she has a daughter with, and she's dating Paul McCartney, who's married to Cynthia Powell, who has a son, Julian. So both John Lennon has a son, Julian, and is married to Cynthia. Yoko Ono has a daughter and is married to a jazz musician in Manhattan, New York. And they're spending time together whilst Paul McCartney is in bed with Francie Swartz, who is employed on the payroll of their recording studio where they work. And Yoko hangs out there. She's not on the payroll. And uh, in the wings pardon the pun, is Linda Eastman, whose real name is Linda Epstein. No relation to Brian Epstein. She's the Epstein from Scarsdale, New York, whose father, whose father is Leopold Vale Epstein, who goes by Lee Eastman, whose eldest son is John Eastman, Linda's older brother, John, and Linda is married to a scion by the name of Mr. Lee, who lives in New Mexico. And I'm not sure they're divorced yet. That's why. So Linda Eastman is married to someone else. Yoko Ono is married to someone else. John Lennon is married to somewhere else. Paul McCartney is not married, but he is engaged to Jane Asher and he's sleeping with Francie... Um, Schwartz. But then on television or media, Jane Asher in July 1968 announces that the engagement with Paul McCartney is over. So now Paul is free like a bird. But instead of getting married to Francie Schwartz, it's Linda Eastman who swoops in like a bird and uh, quick like a bunny rabbit, real quick. Paul McCartney gets married to Linda Eastman on March 12, 1969. Four days later, John Lennon marries Yoko Ono on March 16, 1969. So if you really want to get your history correct, Paul McCartney was the one who got married to a Jewish lawyer first, to Linda e Epstein, because guess what? Her father already had power of attorney, over all things Paul McCartney. So Lee Eastman is Paul McCartney's lawyer. And Paul McCartney marries his lawyer's daughter. And his lawyer puts John Eastman in charge of Paul McCartney, who's the older brother of Linda. So Paul McCartney is now completely and utterly controlled by the Epstein family of New York legally. So you can appreciate that uh, Ringo and George Harrison and John Lennon are feeling threatened, right? Because the only person they really trusted got murdered a couple years ago, Brian Epstein, who was never really in control of the Beatles' music in the first place. So it's a very disturbing situation, and I don't think you can say whose fault it was. Yoko Ono clearly is a part of the Illuminati family. Um, let me give you some uh, specific details that I'm talking about when I speak about uh, Yoko Ono. I want to be real, real clear that you understand that what I'm saying here. All right, so Yoko Ono was born in February 1933 in Tokyo, Japan. Her father was an elite banker, okay? Her mother was a classical pianist. And when I say elite banker, I mean a wealthy banker who has Illuminati family. And um, Yoko Ono's grandfather was an affiliate of the Asada clan. And um, Yoko Ono's fa father came from a long line of samurai warrior scholars. Now that's code for clandestine soldiers, people. And um, 
Two weeks before Yoko Ono was born, her wealthy banker father was transferred to San Francisco. So that was in 1933, her father in San Francisco. And Yoko Ono never saw her father until 1935 when she traveled to San Francisco. But the family made a U-turn. This is before World War II, right? Before World War II. And Yoko Ono was returned back to Tokyo in a, the most expensive neighborhood of Tokyo that the, Al, that the United States uh, Air Force and Army never bombed this part of Tokyo. This is near the palace. This is near the palace. And you should know that Yoko Ono went to school with the person who was became the prince, all right, of Tokyo, of, of Japan. So um, she's coming from the top of the top. Her family, uh, her father was sent to Hanoi. Now that's kind of code for what's going on with Burma, right? Her father transfers to Hanoi and then... Her family um, has roots in Manhattan, New York, because, of course, that's a banking center. That's why Manhattan, New York is important. And um, But the family ends up ensconced back in Tokyo uh, before World War II breaks out. And uh, so there's all these stories about that Yoko Ono had to spend time in a bomb shelter, which maybe she did. However, she was in a neighborhood that never, ever received a bomb. So at no time was Yoko Ono ever in danger of having a bomb or a firebomb attack happen on her because she's living near the palace and that was an off-limits category for World War II. You don't bomb the palace. That's very politically important for the truce that would come eventually. Yoko Ono went to the most elite schools, which is not about money getting into. It's about, yes, you have property and wealth, but you have to be plugged in politically. She went to the, I can't pronounce these names, the most exclusive schools in Tokyo, Japan. She took piano lessons from age four until age 13. So you should know that Yoko Ono had a grooming background similar to Abigail Folger, who also took classical piano lessons and spoke fluent French. Abigail Folger, you could use Abigail Folger as an example who attended private schools um, and played classical piano and, and spoke fluent French and understood wardrobe and fashion design, similar to Yoko Ono, although you might not know it from her interviews. And uh, Abigail Folger's mother, Enos Mejia, who lives on Paul Pelosi Street, Broadway, or lived on Broadway, um, she also was sent at boarding schools throughout the world. And her parents were, of course, ambassadors to El Salvador with uh, residents in San Francisco and in Piedmont and the East Bay. So Illuminati status all the way and um, clandestine service all the way. And that would be true with Yoko Ono's banking family. And that is the woman who ends up getting enrolled as the only female for the most prestigious university in Japan, in Tokyo, into the School of Philosophy. And she only does two sessions, two semesters, and then she moves to Manhattan to join her banking family there, where she enrolls in the Sarah, Sarah Lawrence College in Yonkers, where she uh, marries a classical uh, symphony conductor, same age. They don't get along. She needs psychiatric counseling. Yoko Ono has to see a psychologist. She actually gets institutionalized in a mental hospital for Japanese mental cases. And then it's a jazz musician whom liberates her. She gets pregnant. They get married. She has a daughter. Um, they don't get along either. Yoko Ono's daughter... Um, is a source of contentiousness. And um, Yoko Ono goes on a mission to London to see Paul McCartney, who refers her to John Lennon, who then they connect up and um, get married. And um, like I said, they got married on March 16th, 1969. And within two months, um, they're doing a CI operation in Montreal, Canada, called the Bed In for Peace. During the bed-in for peace, which was uh, scheduled for two weeks, Feb 
uh, beginning uh, May 26th, 1969, is when they started the Bed In For Peace. Timothy Leary, a CIA career soldier who went to West Point and was discharged as an officer in the United States Army. Timothy Leary appears with his wife, Rosemary, one of his five wives. Timothy Leary was married and divorced five times, people. All right. Timothy Leary comes to the Bed Inn in Montreal, Canada, which was at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, in case you're wondering. Timothy Leary is there on the 29th, three days into the Bed for Peace, Bed Inn for Peace. That is a CIA operation. That is John Lennon. That is Yoko Ono. That is Timothy Leary. Meanwhile, you got Paul McCartney is now married to Linda Epstein, a.k.a. Eastman, now McCartney. She's divorced from her scion. They adopt Heather from her previous marriage because even the guy is very wealthy, unknown amount of money. He is an absentee father, so it's decided Paul McCartney will become the legal guardian for Heather. Then they proceed to have three daughters together. And uh, everybody thinks it's a happy story. It seems to be happy, at least from where my angle is. But I got to tell you that things went so quick for Paul McCartney. Jane Asher, Francie Swartz, Linda Epstein, whose father is his lawyer, which is totally inappropriate. When your father, who's 30 years older than you, Lee, Leopold, he's your lawyer and he has his son, in field with you and you're married to his daughter <laughs> Paul McCartney is not in charge of his life he's his wife is plugged into his all of his contracts all of his contractual obligations are controlled by his wife's family and John Lennon everything in his life is controlled through Yoko Ono who's controlled through her wealthy Japanese banker father, who's controlled by British intelligence CIA. Don't you get it? So never mind Travis Doc, never mind the Maharishi. You have Jewish lawyers everywhere you look, and you have bankers everywhere you look who are deciding, you know, like what's going to be on the Ram album and the Beatles never performed together when they hired, uh, you know, Alan, um, what was his name? Klein, Alan Klein from Newark, New Jersey, who ripped off, you know, Lawrence and Edie Gourmet and ripped off the Rolling Stones and ripped off Sam Cooke and then ripped off the Beatles. Who cares? They never performed live in concert when Alan Klein was the manager. I'm sure he ripped them off on the Let It Be album and probably ripped them off on the royalties from previous works that were coming in. But Alan Klein's not managing the Beatles. CBS and RCA manage the Beatles' legacy. They control the public relations for the next 50 years. Not Alan Klein. Not Brian Epstein. Not even Leopold Epstein. They control Paul McCartney. Yoko Ono controls John Lennon, obviously. And George Harrison, he just wants to pull the ripcord and get out, right? I mean, it's like it's Escape from Stalag 17 with William Holden. That's what you have here. All of these cases, the all these murders, Natalie Wood, William Holden, Albert Decker, Sharon Tate, Lena LaBianca, all of these murders involve people trying to escape the eye of the devil. They're trying to get out of their deal. They're resisting. They're saying no. And when people don't follow orders, as Jack Nicholson taught us in A Few Good Men, when people don't follow orders, people die. We follow orders or people die. That's the quote. We follow orders or people die. Could be your children, could be you, could be your parents. People die. We don't specifically n name the people. All right, that's my story today. I'm not going to blame Yoko Ono for the breakup of the Beatles. If it wasn't Yoko Ono, it would have been some Russian spy who married John Lennon. But the point is that once you make it big as a social engineer, you're completely and utterly controlled. Whether it's Francie Swartz 
or whether it's Linda Epstein named Eastman or whether it's Oliver, Oliver Silverstein and his films or whether it's Abigail Folger and Enos Mejia. We follow orders or people die. That includes Nancy DeLosandro Pelosi. That includes Paul Pelosi. That includes Lena LaBianca. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.